Good. So I can provide that as a brief announcement. You know, um, you you've done a great job. You you really did, yeah. and I think that made all the difference. So, well, thank you very much. And uh, my colleague Jennifer Gilbert uh, has been just absolutely fantastic throughout this, as she was when we introduced the organics program in 2016. Um, and we are extremely lucky that she is uh, here to guide us through this process. Yeah. Well, I can, I can, I can tell you, I'm down here in Burbank, and I happen to have to call the city for a different reason uh, regarding my, our mom's utilities, and I mentioned 1383. Uh, it was a 30 minute conversation of groaning and moaning by the city of Burbank about all the things that are so unnecessary for them to do. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. when, and they no, said, we are just one voice in a huge number of people that feel they're going to get swamped by this. Yeah, not a, not yeah. a surprise, certainly. And I would, I, I like to say, as I told Mike and Kelly, who obviously uh, heaped praise on uh, Jennifer and Adrian, I said, I'm the smart one in the room. I just stay out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we are, we are light, light years ahead of Burbank. There's no problem. Oh, yeah, we are, yeah. I, uh, I will just mention that, that Burbank is quite progressive as an electric utility. Ah. They, they do differ. Yeah, that's really true. There and they are doing some innovative stuff. They, they, you know, it's interesting you say that, Lorenzo, because they have Burbank Power and Light and there you they are doing some really incredible things there and yeah. i just want to just say that what they do here i've got a flyer that they sent out to their residents i'm going to bring it back uh, when i have an opportunity and i'll i'll give it to you adrian if you can find it online it's a pdf i'll send it to you mm -hmm. it is really informative and really helpful Great. Um, so you can take a look at it and see if it can inform what we do Absolutely. Okay. We're always looking for ideas. Should we get the meeting started? Let's get going. Yes, please. Um, so, Adrian, will you do the roll call? Make sure we're all here. Absolutely, I will. Uh, Jerry Braun? Here. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Cullen? I think Andrew's here. I see him. I see him. He's oh. muted. Oh, there he is. Oh, He's present. Here. There he is. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Linda Dios. Here. Steve Gallen. Here. Lorenzo Kristoff. Here. Emma O'Rourke Powell. Here. Elaine Roberts Musser. Here. And Jan Trust. Here. All here. Excellent. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? So moved. Jan moved. Do I have a second? Lorenzo seconds. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, any discussion on the agenda? Hearing none. Any abstentions? No. Any opposition, so to speak? <laughs> um, can we just say by unanimous consent, we have an agenda? We have an agenda. Okay. Brief announcements from staff commissioners and liaisons. I don't see a liaison here. Um, um, staff? So to follow up on what I mentioned um, before we formally got started, so our staff did uh, have a great discussion with the city council last night on SB 1383, and um, we brought the implementation plan to them uh, along with all of the comments from the Utilities Commission, the Natural Resources Commission, and the Social Services Commission. Um, there are, of course, many additional meetings and check-ins that we will have regarding these regulations. Um, but I know that the city council was very appreciative of all of the work, not just of staff, also of the commissions um, in reviewing these very complicated regulations in uh, what is a very short period of time uh, and being able to put the city in a great place for um, you know, compliance yeah, starting in January, 2022. So uh, wanted to share that. Um, I don't know that there was anything else that we had, Stan? Not, not that I'm recalling at this point, nope. Yep, so I think that's it from staff. Um, commissioners? Yeah, I have um, five articles I've been reading again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, Elaine's been reading. <laughs> um, 
One article is on uh, how the new wastewater rules are um, doing away with coal-fired power plants, which is a good thing. Another one, which I thought was fascinating, is how ancient Romans went to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's fascinating. And then um, there's also a talk, talk about the, an article about the new worst toxic waste. They're called nurdles, little pieces hmm. of plastic. So mm. that's another one. And then uh, there's something called a robotic film that's gonna can clean up oil spills. That's another article. And there's another discussion about step wells that India is using uh, to conserve water. So oh. I'll pass along these five articles, all very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Jerry, or no, you were laughing, sorry. Um, I would like to add, put this out there. I mean, it's been in the news, at least I've heard it the last couple of days about this whole thing with solar panels and our subsidies going away or being reduced. The piece on that, and it looks like they're going in a particular direction that way. So not for tonight, but I would like to hear from somebody here that I know is an expert in this area. <laughs> if this is a good or bad thing that's happening. I mean, I hear from one that it's going to shut down the solar industry in California, and I hear from utilities that say, oh, my God, if we don't do this, we're going under. So putting that out there. Me to me well, like line. many things in our, in our public discourse these days, it's highly polarized, and it's very hard to get good information yeah. from uh, things like press coverage an article so that's a struggle but um the decision is really kind of drastic it has some good things in it but it's also got some things in it that are not good and that's it's very politicized okay thank you lorenzo yeah I... uh, we'll be final until next month january okay. 27th or so is when they may vote to finalize it okay yeah I... No, I tuned in to uh, a webinar today, learned a, quite a bit more about it. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think there will be a lot of discussion in the next uh, in the next few weeks and it may it may converge. Uh, but um, uh, you know it, it has some pretty pretty severe implications for the uh, retail solar industry. I, I think it'd be interesting to hear from the uh, from the local solar retailers and you know what they what they see um, okay. because I think they are the lost you know <laughs> they're the folks that um, are not directly in the process and they're being represented by a relatively new industry organization that uh, may or may not wait know its way around the CPUC and and so forth mm -hmm. uh, so. I think there's a lot at risk. Um, you know, there, uh, I see there, you know, probably more downsides of what's going on than than upsides. It's a, uh, um, you know, there's a, you know, the good intentions to uh, get the retail solar folks to do things they've never done done before, um, and um, but that in that involves, uh, you know, the uh, utilities and the CPUC doing their part and doing it in a timely way and clear way. And that's not been their habit. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot at risk. Okay. And there are some, some funny um, inconsistencies with California policy. So for example, Title 24 requires that all new residential construction have solar panels on the roof. Well, mm -hmm. if you build a new house and put solar panels on the roof, according to this dis proposed decision, you're also locking in the home buyer into a monthly charge of something like 50 to $60 per month because of having that solar on the roof. So there's mm -hmm. you know, conflicting incentives here, uh, right. which exemplifies the state not quite having its act together. I think, okay. I, th I think, I think we're getting into the realm. Yeah, I know. Realm we're going to move session. on now. No, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm sorry. But, I, I stirred that up. Stan. No, no, it's, it's, it's no. a great topic and you're asking the right question. I think um, if we'd like to, we should uh, potentially at long range look to agenda. Yeah. If uh, there's more. I, I agree. Yeah. Well, I just, agree. Just one more, just one more thing. If you get folks asking you about this, uh, tell them 
that if they're even thinking about solar to go ahead with it because they've got about another four months before everything changes probably. Okay. And Andrew, if you're talking on this, I'm going to move on. So. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. No, as I want, I'll keep it brief. I just want sure. to let the commission know that I went to the NRC meeting at the end of November. Um, the city has, from what I can tell, has pushed out the uh, cap, is rel relevant to the cap, has pushed out the uh, cap timeline out a bit. So uh, they're still working on finalizing actions and they're starting to work on the implementation steps. They went to the city council, I believe, on the 7th. Um, I went back and watched that and there was pretty positive reception from city council, um, but there's still a bit more work to do. Um, I guess the good side is there's just, there's more time. So uh, I think from what I could saw it, it's been pushed out till May or June for adoption by city council. Okay. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Andrew. Um, you're supposed to talk longer because I'm chewing. Okay. Um, is there anybody here for public comment that you can see? No, no public comment. All right, good. The consent calendar, we have um, the minutes from November 17th. Um, do I have a motion to move the consent calendar? So moved. Elaine moves, do I have a second? Second. Jerry seconds. Any discussion? No. Any opposition, as I said? No. By unanimous consent, we have moved the consent calendar. So let us move on to the regular items, the wastewater cost of service study. Stan, are you going to lead this or our guest? Uh, well, I'll, I'll uh, obviously introduce it. Yep, we're back before you again, once again. <laughs> uh, Doug and Abigail are here from Bartles Wells. Um, Doug is going to go through a presentation, um, which uh, I believe we'll answer some questions and obviously tee up some of the uh, some of the questions previously that the, the commission had asked, but also uh, tee up some of the the questions that we hope to get some resolution on this evening. Uh, if we don't get all the way there, we certainly won't, uh, hope to get uh, a portion of the way there. So, uh, Doug, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you, Stan. Good evening, commissioners, and happy holidays, everybody. I'm going to present, I've got about a 21 slide uh, presentation, and at the end, we're going to ask you to weigh in on about uh, four decision points and um, to keep things moving, uh, I would request that uh, we hold the questions till the end. Now, I know this commission is never too formal, so if you have an absolute need to ask a question, go ahead and ask it. But um, try to hold them to the end and then we'll go back through everything and we can drill down as deep as you want. Um, so just to kind of frame the, the discussion, back in May, we uh, <clears throat> presented and, and, and we uh, got a, agreement uh, to do a five year, 5% 5 per year overall revenue increase for the wastewater utility. And um, so that hasn't changed. Now we've got the rate structure uh, recommendation uh, to go through and we have a couple of decision points on the rate structure. And um, last meeting in uh, October, uh, we, we presented uh, some of these. Uh, so a lot of it uh, of this is gonna be a bit of a review, uh, but we have uh, done some more uh, research and analysis and we have uh, researched some questions that were asked uh, in the prior meeting, and we have answers to those. So basically, the decision points we're looking at are what ratio of fixed to variable charge is appropriate for residential. Your utility is about 88% residential that, as far as revenue, 12% commercial. So on the residential side, you have fixed charges and you have volumetric charges. And right now, the volumetric charge produces about 57% of the uh, income and the fixed charge only about 43%. And so we're recommending that you shift that more to the fixed. Uh, and that's because you're 
your costs are arguably much more fixed on wastewater. And, it, you know, it's kind of a subjective amount what what is the exact split of fixed and variable but somewhere 50 to 70 percent fixed is is typical so we're proposing a 60 40 option a 50 50 option and then a, a third option which would start at the current uh, 43 fixed and phase up to 60 40. other uh decision points uh should we condense the multifamily category? Um, right now you have different rates for duplex dwelling unit, triplex dwelling unit, fourplex dwelling unit, fiveplex mobile home. Should we just have one multifamily dwelling unit fixed rate or keep the, the ones you have? In, either way works. Another point is uh, the commercial categories. You currently have uh, six or seven categories, and um, a lot of agencies are consolidating down to three or four strength categories. And so we'll look at that. And um, another point is whether to add a, a per, per the bed uh, rate for dormitory style multifamily. And these are uh, buildings where they have high, higher than normal number of beds per bedroom or per apartment. And so the current apartment rates don't really apply so well. So we're, um, we're gonna go through those. Next slide, please. So this is the 60-40 option. And again, your current rates here are uh, based on a 43% fixed. This would go right up to 60% fixed. And this is, this is a portion of the residential charge that, um, that would be fixed every month. And then you would also have a volumetric rate. So the higher the fixed rate, the lower the volumetric rate. And so that kind of de-emphasizes uh, the, the volumetric portion. And we're, Looking at that, because you know the fixed costs are, are the, the majority of the cost on wastewater, and with climate change, we're seeing um, you know more irrigation in the winter time, and so um, using winter water consumption as a proxy for the residential uh, sewer flow, not as accurate as it used to be. So um, we're recommending that we look at these uh, options that are more uh, fixed in nature as far as the revenue recovery. Now, on the commercial side, there's no difference in any of the fixed variable because the commercial rates are 100% variable. Um, and again, the commercial uh, is about 12% of, of your revenues. And a lot of agencies um, have tried to implement a fixed and variable charge for commercial. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of wide variation in businesses and it just doesn't really lend itself to um, you know, an, an easy and, and clean rate structure. So the, the vast majority of, of wastewater rates have volumetric for commercial. But for residential, we see 100% fixed, we see partial fixed, and 100% variable. And uh, so you, what you have right now on, on residential is uh, a combination of fixed and, and variable, and we, we think that's a great structure. We're just, look, you know, think it's a good idea to go a little bit more to the fixed side of the charge. So this is the 60-40 chart. Um, you have a base rate, which is just per account for customer billing, uh, and then a monthly fixed charge. And right now it's $18.26 per single family home. And with the 60-40 um, option, that would go to $27.78. So we're putting more of the charge on the fixed and less on the variable. The volume 
is currently $3.13 per 100 cubic foot winter water use, that would go down to $2.08 with the 60-40 option. So next slide. With the 50-50, the, um, the, the fixed charge would only go up to $22.67. Uh, that first year, instead of the, I think it was a twenty seven seventy eight with the with the sixty uh, percent fix. So on the fifty fifty, we're only going up to twenty two sixty seven, but the volumetric rate is two dollars and eighty one cents uh, with the fifty percent, and instead of the two dollars and eight cents. So a little bit, a little bit uh, different mix there. Um, it's a little closer to, to what we currently have. And um, either way, it, it generates the same revenue, whether you do the 60-40, the 50-50, or our third option, which is start with the current and phase up to 60-40. And so this option three, in that final year in 2026, that's the 60-40 rates just like the 60-40 option, but we're phasing it in. As you can see, this compares the 60-40 uh, rates with the phased in. Instead of 27.78 a month uh, in 22, the phased in would start would go at $22.47 and gradually phase up. So, um, you know, what, what, what ratio uh, is, the optimal one. They all they all work. They're all good. Um, we like the 60-40, whether we get there right away or if we phase it in, uh, that we're fine with that. So let's move on to the next uh, issue, which is the multifamily. So right now you have different rates for uh, a dwelling unit whether it's a, in a duplex, a, a triplex, a fourplex, fiveplex, or, or a larger apartment building, a mobile home, and a condominium. While you only have one rate for all single family homes, um, you know, the option is to either stay with this, uh, you know, individual rates, uh, which vary from 1246, Per dwelling unit for a condominium up to about 1532 for a, a, a dwelling unit in a fourplex. Um, the option would be to go to just a single per dwelling unit, multifamily dwelling unit charge. And so we've um, calculated that out with the 60 40 uh, split, that would go to $18.90 of uh, the multifamily rate or $15.42 on the 50-50. And the, the volumetric rate, um, it would be $1.98 with the 60-40 or two sixty seven dollars on the 50-50. So either way, whether we go with, uh, you know, a single multifamily dwelling unit rate or stick with these individual rates generates the same volume. It's just a little simpler on the multifamily uh, if, if we have a blended rate. So next slide. Uh, one second, Jerry does have his uh, hand up. Jerry, if you uh, if you have a question that that you need to ask um, or a comment, yeah, it, it can wait. I, I just was curious as to the pros and cons of the phase in, um, and spe especially if there are any, you know, <laughs> any uh, cons or. <laughs> any sure. reason not to uh, phase it in sure we can and i and i think we can we can certainly answer that i think at the end if you're okay with that i'm fine with that sure cool all right thanks jerry all right next slide please so this uh just compares the residential bill impact for uh the different fixed variable options single family and multifamily, and you can see the total bill is is pretty much the same uh, for a typical customer that uses 700 cubic foot 
in the winter per month. Um, and the rate currently, you know, it's $44 and 11 cents. It would go up to around $46 the first year and then up gradually to about 56, 60 per month uh, in uh, 2026. And these rates are, are effective May 1st of each year. So our, our first step would be May 1st of 2022. On the multifamily, um, you know, the, the current total cost is about $34, and that would gradually increase up to about $42 over the five years, assuming uh, 700 cubic foot. Next slide, please. This slide just shows you the uh, survey of uh, the rates in surrounding communities and your current rate there, 4411 and the uh, other, you know, the options 4525 up to 4662, really very similar. And then Woodland is currently a fully fixed rate at $62.15 a month. And Winters is uh, a hybrid at uh, $63. And so these, you know, you're on the lower end of the local scale and um, you, you've got a, a really good, um, you know, financial plan and you have money in the bank and you're, you're in great financial shape. Um, so that it's a good testament to the city's um, management of the utility. Yeah, last night we just raised the utilities rates up to one hundred and fifty dollars a month for sewer. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that are paying over a hundred dollars. Uh, you're still uh, below fifty. So that that's kind of a, a perspective. <laughs> Next slide, please. So now let's talk about dormitory. Uh, this is sort of a new uh, style of uh, housing. And you're seeing a lot more beds in each apartment. Uh, and typically, you know, think of a traditional apartment, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom. You know, maybe you have four beds in the apartment max. We're seeing nine, eight and nine units, beds per unit. And that, if, if you're looking at a rate and you're, you know, if you have these new uh, dormitories that are putting nine beds in, a, in a, an apartment, it's not fair to charge them the same apartment rate as somebody who has a one bedroom, a one bed, single bed. So this is a very small group of customers and we think it really applies to, you know, developments where they have five or more beds per apartment. And um, so this would be a per bed charge. And um, so next slide. You can see the, the comparison of the current rates with the proposed um, per bed rates. The, the fixed charge goes up significantly on the, the per bed. And that's a reflection of how, you know, they're just cramming so many beds into one apartment. Um, so when you go to a per bed charge, it does increase the fixed charge. But again, it, you know, I would argue that's much more fair to, to everyone in the system when, when you're putting nine beds in, in, a, in an apartment. Um, and so this is kind of a small, group of customers, uh, it's negligible overall revenue impact, um, but I think it improves the equity. And uh, so we, we think going with this per bed charge for a dormitory style, you know, where you have more than five, five or more beds per unit, apartment unit is, is a fair way to go. And next slide. These numbers are monthly bills? Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, there was a question, you know, 
are other cities using the by the bed calculation for their wastewater rates? And yes, we, uh, we found a number of cities, Los Angeles County sanitation districts, charges a per bed rate for um, convalescent homes, Donner Summit Public Utility District charges a per bed rate <clears throat> for their uh, dormitory uh, accommodations up in the Sierras. And for them, they have a charge based, a, it's a, a quarter of an equivalent dwelling unit per bed. And that does not, I believe, include, that, that's without laundry facilities. So the dormitories in Davis will have laundry facilities and will have dining facilities. Uh, so we're recommending a, a one third EDU charge for, for the bed per bed in, uh, in Davis. And in Sacramento, for their capacity fees, they, uh, they charge 0.3 equivalent uh, service, uh, service units per bed uh, for a college dorm or boarding house. So, so there is precedent and it is done in, in the uh, area. So next slide. Question was, uh, are there other methods calculating the unit equivalent for the by the bed charge? What we did is we looked at the average uh, sewer flow per person. And, you know, assuming one person per bed, we've got uh, a flow and then we, calculated a charge of one third of an EDU per, per bed. There are other ways to do it. Um, you could uh, look at the number of bedrooms. You could look at the number of dwelling units, uh, which is your current basis. But as we mentioned, that, that has um, you know, shortcomings. You could look at uh, the number of people. Uh, you could look at Water meter size, some agencies look, uh, you know, set their fixed charges for wastewater based on the water meter size. You know, assuming that a larger water meter means higher uh, water use and, and therefore higher wastewater flow. Or you could look at prior year flows um, and, and base future charges on prior flows. But we, you know, we think the number of uh, beds is, is the easiest and, and best uh, way to charge these dormitory style developer developments. Next slide, please. So now the final uh, decision point is the commercial volumetric rates. Right now, as I mentioned, you have about six or seven uh, different commercial categories. C1 through C7. C7, I believe, is industrial, which is there aren't any customers. So effectively, you have six categories right now. And the rates range from $4.53 up to $8.12 per 100 cubic foot for these different categories. And that's based on the strength of the wastewater. And C2 and C3 actually have the same rate. So obviously those two could be easily combined. But what we're seeing and what we recommend is that you set four commercial strength categories, a low strength, standard strength, which is a similar to residential, medium strength, and high strength. And so we would have four different volumetric rates and then you would have a, a sub list that would carry, you know, list which types of businesses fall into each category. But as far as the rates are concerned, we would just have the four strength rates. And so this is um, combining and condensing the commercial rates. And so next, next slide, please. Real quick question. When you yeah. say strength, what are you referring to? I'm referring to uh, you know the, the pollutants that are in the water when it's discharged. So okay. it ranges from clean water to really you know thick, gooey, <laughs> you know sugary syrup type stuff. So um, 
obviously it, it's more treatment is re required for the, the higher strength waste. And typically that is food related industries. So yeah, Doug, Doug, that's, that's the key, Elaine, is it's, it's um, uh, you know, when we talked about uh, a few meetings uh, where we talked about BOD, uh, TSS and ammonia, total suspended solids, biochemical oxygen demand, and then ammonia. Um, as you get higher strength wastewater, you see a higher BOD load, which it takes more energy and more uh, effort to treat. So that's, that's primarily how you go up that scale, right? Okay, so it's referring to all those things then when you talk about pollutants. Yes. Okay, yes. got it. Doug, you can correct me if I'm off base there. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the pollutants that we look at are the biochemical oxygen demand, the suspended solids, and the ammonia. Okay. So uh, next next slide. Yeah. A question? Okay. Uh, my question is, Doug, do we have any comparable rates for commercial for other communities? And we may have seen that in other documents that you produced, and I'm sorry that I don't have that in front of me, but do we have those numbers? Because it seems to me that um, I understand that we want to give an incentive to our businesses in the city, but I'm wondering how our homeowners are going to feel about what looks like a fairly significant subsidy for commercial properties. And if the burden facing us with climate change affects all people the same, um, why the differential? D Doug, if I could start off on that. Go ahead. So, so and certainly jump in. But uh, Jan, we're, we're not subsidizing. I mean, uh, the financial plan allocates based on flows, based, uh, uh, allocates the total cost to either commercial or residential. And then these rates are reflective of that um, dollar amount that we need to collect from each. So there is no subsidy with this. Um, uh, uh, rate structure. They are different, yes, but it's different amounts of money we need to collect um, from each category. Uh, Doug, if you want to expand on that. Um, and Yeah, the, the, the rates are calculated to be proportional. So if you discharge uh, as a commercial customer, you'll have a little bit different rate structure, but you would pay the same effective rate. And so commercial is the charge is basically all volumetric, but it's a higher per, you know, volume charge than the residential, which has also a fixed component. So the, nobody's getting subsidized. It's the just, rates are calculated to provide, you know, equal share, share for everybody to pay. Based I on just that. want to caution then we should be I don't want anybody to be misconstrued about this. Thirst, thank you for clarifying that, Stan and Doug. Um, I think if we're in, in your report, I would suggest that that be called out just to be sure that nobody makes any error around that assumption. Just a suggestion. Thank you. Okay, and we don't have a commercial survey, but we, we can add that to the report. And so another question uh, that was raised is, you know, describe how the strengths of the different types of businesses were calculated. And so for the flow, we looked at the plant uh, influent 2016 to 2020, uh, average 2019 winter water use. For the biochemical oxygen demand, we looked at the average annual BOD pounds, uh, total suspended solids. We looked at the average 2016 to 2020 uh, TSS and the ammonia. We're, we're looking at 2020 sampling data. And um, next slide, please. So then, you know, how, how do the strengths of different types of businesses get calculated? Um, you know, we had the total flow influent uh, measurements that I just mentioned at the plant. Uh, we have effluent sampling data. There are state revenue program guidelines that uh, have standard, you know, strengths and, and, and 
pollutant loads for different businesses. Um, city staff input, we did literature search to look at other communities and how, uh, you know, what their strengths they're seeing from different businesses. Um, and also just our experience, you know, in, in the industry for many, many years um, was how we estimated the, the strengths for, for the different businesses. Uh, next slide, please. So on that condensed uh, four strength uh, schedule, we would have low strength, um, domestic strength, which is also called standard strength, and then uh, medium strength and high strength. And so this is just an example of some of the businesses that would go into each one of these uh, categories, like a low strength would be a bank or um, you know, an office or school. Um, you know, we're, you're not really seeing much food production. Um, domestic or standard strength would be similar to residential, which, you know, bars and taverns with minimal food uh, uh, production, churches, auto dealers, appliance repair, um, and so forth. And then uh, next slide. And you can see how some of these uh, compare to your current strength categories, the medium strength, auto dealer with service facilities, um, machine shop, restaurant without a dishwasher or garbage disposal, um, mini mart without a dishwasher and a garbage disposal. You know, a lot of different businesses have food sales and it makes a difference whether they produce the food on site and you know, wash a lot of the, the dishes and so forth uh, down uh, the drain or whether they have prepackaged food. So um, if it's really you know, intense food production where you're making the food and cleaning the plates and putting stuff down the garbage disposal, that would be a high strength uh, category. And that would include restaurants with dishwashers and garbage disposals, um, cheese makers, um, you know, anything like a bakery or a butcher shop. So um, this would be um, a list of agencies that would be, you know, maintained by at the staff level. So the, the council would adopt the, the four strength category rates. And then uh, over time, sometimes uh, industries change. Uh, for example, um, you know, like a car wash in the past, they would just do the car wash and all the water would go back down the drain to the sewer and it would be very uh, dilute and uh, low strength. But then you know, with as water became more and more expensive, a lot of the car washes started to recycle the water. And then what they put down the waste uh, was much lower, much, much higher strength. So, um, you know, industries evolve and this kind of is a way of classifying them and allows um, staff to, to make adjustments as needed. So that's the um, commercial category of the four strengths, low, standard, medium, and high. Um, next slide. So this summarizes the commercial bill impacts. <clears throat> and so, you know, you're currently, you have C1 through C6, the commercial bill, and this assumes 700 cubic foot of water per month, uh, would go from 35.65 to $60.78 under the current rates. And so that would increase over the five years, you know, to $45.32 for the low strength up to $76.72. And it's virtually the same with the, uh, the four strength categories as with the six strength categories. Again, each year will be a 5% rate increase. 
So um, next slide. Another question was about affordability and um, how Davis's rates, uh, you know, look as far as affordability. And so the EPA has a threshold for wastewater. It's 1.5% uh, of the median household income. So it's affordable if it's below 1.5%. And so with the proposed single family bill of around $46 and 58 cents, um, that works out to $557 and 16 cents per year with an average household income from the 2019 census of 57,454, that calculates out to just about 1%. So um, you're still in the affordable range. Um, we see communities that are you know in the three four percent range, and at that point it's really an affordability issue. But for Davis, you guys are are still uh, within the affordability window. So next next slide. There was a question about the um, COVID impact on the sewer uh, flow and sewer demand, and this is a graph that shows um, the twenty twenty. Uh, flow, which is the green line, and the um, 2016 to 2020 average. So a little bit different, but, you know, initially it looks like in the early part of the pandemic, it was uh, a little different, but it pretty much trended right back to uh, track with, with the pre-2020 um, average. I don't know, Stan. Do you want to have any other comments on that? No, I think I think it. You know, the the question was what you know what 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 flow changes did we see? And this this graph shows, you know, from an average perspective, we certainly saw um, some changes. Um, but your, to your point, it basically came back to normal. You know, once we got further into the pandemic and the the future year. Or so, all right. Uh, yeah. uh, next slide is our last one. And this is just a summary of the uh, four kind of decision points. Um, first of all, the ratio of fixed and variable revenues for the, the residential and uh, BWA and staff recommendation is 60% fixed and that should say 40% volumetric. Uh, it would provide more stable rev rate revenue. Um, the, should the city condense the current multifamily fixed rate categories BWA and staff recommendation is yes. Um, it will simplify the, the rate structure and uh, you know, arguably be, be fair to everybody. Um, should the city adopt a separate fixed rate per bed for dormitory style multifamily? BWA and staff recommendation is yes. That is a, a fair way to do it. And it, it's you know, easy to administer. And uh, we think that's the good way to do it. Uh, and then finally, should the city condense the current commercial rate categories uh, and BWA and staff recommendations? Yes, um, that will improve the, you know, the administration of the, of the rates and simplify things for customers as well. So with that, um, we would like to open it up to the commission and uh, get your feedback. Linda Dios here. First of all, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate all the time you've taken and the several meetings you've attended um, to bring this to us. It really makes a difference and helps us <laughs> to make any decisions here. So I'm going to open up to questions and circle back at that point. So yeah, I would, uh, Linda, one, one thing we do yeah. have one member of the public. Uh, so ah. At some point, when you when you feel appropriate, we we uh, can open it up to public comment as well. Um, normally, you take commission comments first, right? Correct. Yeah. If if you want clarifying questions and those types of things, and then and then maybe public comment, and then back for yeah. further discussion. Oh, completely up to you, Linda. No, that no, that's fine. So, are the folks I see whose hands are up, are they clarifying questions? Keep them up if they are. So, I have Jerry. Lorenzo and Andrew. So Jerry. 
Yeah, going back, going back to the question I asked before, um, you know, is the, the question of phasing in versus not phasing in, is that a choice that, is there a recommendation on that? Are there pros and cons? Uh, I'm not a clear about that, uh, what, what you're recommending and, and what the pros and cons are. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we want to get to 60-40, uh, whether that's in the first year or whether that's phased in over five years, that doesn't matter. Um, phasing it in provides, you know, a more gradual change. Um, you don't have such possibility of big rate shocks. Um, that's something that's commonly, you know, the phasing is commonly used in, in rate making. Um, on the other hand, going directly to the 60-40 will pr provide more revenue stability. Um, so either way is fine, but I think we have been living with to get it. to the 60-40. Wait, Steve, your Maybe hand's there. not up. I don't Wait, have Steve. a, my, I'm sorry, my version yeah, so doesn't I'm gonna call on people whose hands are up. Right, I don't right have now. the ability. I don't have the ability to raise my hand on the version I'm using. I apologize. So if you'll just call on me when it's appropriate, I, I will do. We'll do. Can can I just... one, thing, one thing I might add to that, if I can remember. Um, <laughs> so, so the ultimately the the bill when you if you look at the phasing in uh, table, the 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 average bill doesn't necessarily change. Um, so it's it's not a dollar amount question. It's more. How much is variable and how much is uh, fixed as we go through the five years? So, from my perspective, keeping that consistent actually is better off for the customer. They know exactly where they're at versus every year we tweak the variable and fixed rate. So, from from my perspective, I think just doing the sixty forty as we recommend, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily change the the bill that they're paying each month, right, Doug? Right. Right. Yeah. So, that, so from a staff and, and a consultant perspective, our team, we would not recommend the phasing in. We would just go to the 6040 as we've recommended. That's what I was trying to get at. So we need to uh, agree with that or disagree with that, right? Can we look at slide seven that talks to that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Sorry if I'm freaking anybody out here. But <laughs> Whoops. Uh, slide seven of the presentation. I'm sorry. Got you. No, no worries. Yep, that was my fault. Uh, let's see. That's it. There it is. Yep. But that that does reflect a difference depending on whether we phase it in or not. It's not a huge difference, but there is a difference. It it is it is around a dollar a month. Yes. Or, or less, depending on you know where you're at. Yep. Lorenzo. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, good presentation. I, I have a couple of questions about the uh, the dormitory style apartments, and I'm I'm wondering if that categorization is completely unambiguous, or it's something that can vary in over time, or can be fudged in in some way. Um, and you know, if so, how how is it determined? And and then. I think about, say, a three-bedroom house in a residential neighborhood that might have five beds in it, and I wonder, are they going to be paying about the same as a five-bed dormitory-style apartment? So how, you, you know, you see what I'm getting at. Yeah, the the single family. I think it's based on about three occupants. Uh, per per dwelling on average. Okay. And, and there's a single rate for all single family dwellings. Um, but we do have some single family houses like with three bedrooms that have five beds in them and sort of function as a dorm style apartment. So that's why I'm wondering how, how cleanly defined is the categorization? Yeah, I think it's, you know, looking at the traditional apartments where you have one to four beds, let's say, and then these new 
uh, structures which have eight or nine beds per per dwelling essentially it's a big difference and you know it, again it's not a huge revenue issue it's more fairness issue okay so the 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 owner of the apartment complex declares i'm going to be a dorm style apartment and therefore i'm going to be on this per bed rate is that like just a declaration made by the the building owner that is then that's their category well no it's it's it would be based on the design of the apartments as it goes through the development process so as as the couple that we have highlighted here went through the process they were they were designed that way so you understand how many how many beds are there uh, total in the development? So that would be assessed as part of the uh, project uh, use, uh, uh, project plans, if you will, um, for each of those. Okay, so then this would reply would apply to new developments. Well, and or and or potentially as the ones we've identified are either approved. I don't know that they're. I have to go back and look at them again. I don't know if they're built per se, but the if they're approved. Uh, and built, then they would apply to those. And then certainly any new ones that came in that were approved by council um, that had, you know, more than five per unit, um, we would look to use the per bed rate as the appropriate uh, wastewater category. And then for, for the single family, uh, you know, what, what individuals do in their homes and how they uh, pack them is, is, is that, that's a touchy, that, that would be very difficult because that is certainly not a planning level look. Um, so that that one that one while, while I, I recognize what you're indicating, uh, that potentially would be a, a, a significant challenge to try and um, police and and make sure that we're accurate. Yeah, I, I understand that. So I'm I'm just trying to clarify exactly how that's going to be applied. So that yeah, makes it sense. would. Yeah, yeah, and uh, hopefully I answered that, Lorenzo. Yeah, you did. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, uh, Doug, thanks again for your presentation. I know this isn't the first time and I'm just trying to make sure I have the dots connected. Uh, I just kind of want to go back maybe one step uh, just because I was recently thinking about our solid waste fund as well. Is the model for all, you know, I guess I'm just wondering, I know we, the city took a loan from the wastewater account for solid waste is it is that factored in to the model for this for these rate adjustments um not really because we i wasn't aware of this loan um stan do you know about that yeah i do Cur currently the loan from solid waste is not being paid back except for interest only. So to account for it here would not be not be necessarily appropriate um, to set the maximum rate of 5% that we, we looked at. What I would say though is if the solid waste fund is able to pay back that loan more aggressively than what we're doing now, uh, remember these 5% each year are maximums. So if we were starting to pay back that loan, um, say in year three, say five one uh, for this the slide on the screen five one twenty twenty four. Uh, if we only had to raise uh, the rates or recommend a rate increase of three percent to account for the revenue we're receiving from the solid waste fund, we could do that. So as we go each year, we would we would be able to adjust for that if we're able to pay for that back more aggressively. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I just I want to make sure that we weren't uh, assuming that would be back as part of this. Exactly. So thank you. Uh -huh. Hey, Steve. Thank you. Um, just uh, going back to the dormitory one more time. Um, I'm sure we've killed it to death, but with the, the, the significant increases that you see there, and I'm not suggesting they're not fair and appropriate. Certainly conceptually they are. Do we have any idea what those, how they would affect rents? Are they material enough to, to affect actual what the rents would be in those in those buildings are they significant enough it's it, so so good question um obviously you know each each landlord renter owner uh, you know they determine the rent that they charge for each of those beds 
Um, I, I wouldn't suggest that it's not uh, uh, an increase that is certainly, a, as you saw in the slide, uh, you know, it is, it is an adjustment and it is, is an increase. Whether or not the landlords would choose to, uh, or the owners of those apartments would choose to pass on the full amount um, is, is difficult to say. You, you could assume that yes, um, the, the rent would go up by some degree. Um, total amount, um, I don't know if we have that, Doug. Um, or yeah, I not, think not total amount of rent increase, but total amount of increase in the, the bill per bed, I guess would be a, a better way maybe. Yeah, we're we're looking at seven to nine dollars per bed. Okay. Okay. Uh, you per, answered per my month. question then. So it's do, do, okay. not a huge amount. It's de minimis. Okay. I, Thank yeah. You. I actually I have one follow up too. Sorry. When you're done seeing go go okay. ahead. I'll, I'll... I'll keep it quick like, is this based on the dorm piece? I just I I, I appreciate the affordability discussion. I think that now just gets me thinking about affordability based on who you are could be quite different, which of these different classifications you're in. I guess an average, a median isn't very helpful to me in thinking about what's affordable in Davis given the distribution that we have. And then we're, you know, creating quite distribution in the different rate payers, you know, plus. So to me, I just, I'd be curious to, to know what, you know, the percentages of uh, household income for a dorm uh, resident, you know, with this increase in costs, and I'm guessing that they are not at $54,000 a year. Um, that's just my two cents. But. That's per, that is precisely my, my next question is if we go to that slide, I understand the EPA has a way of looking at it. But if we look at the, say, the lowest 20% um, uh, of, of, of um, income for families, I would imagine that you know, we are closer to the 1.5% for them than we are for the total population. And the question is, given the skew that Andrew just talked about, is that something we want to be concerned about? Again, not, not today, but is that something we should have in mind as we think about affordability? And again, given the comparisons Doug shared with us, you know, we're 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 over from a cost standpoint compared to our our peers, we're doing a nice job. Uh, still, I think you have to worry about those 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 lowest twenty percent, and and maybe it's not a rate making decision, but maybe it's a subsidy that that comes from another part of of of, of the, of the uh, city. Yeah, that, Steve, that's a that's a great uh, ending comment there, and and I would I would caution that. We, we, we are not, obviously with Prop 218 and, and with the requirements, you know, we want to do what's fair and equitable from a rate perspective. Whether it's affordable or not isn't necessarily the key question, right. unfortunately. Um, that is That would generate into a discussion of are there subsidy programs or are there other programs that council should consider? Um, but from a rate perspective, we do need to be very cautious about um, one user class paying for another. That is absolutely the heart of Prop 218. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Did you have another follow-up question? I had one other question, and it was when we talked about this loan. I'm, I'm still okay. struggling how the behavior of one utility can affect the rate need, the potential rate need for another utility. I thought that was not, not uh, appropriate. I'm, I'm sorry, could you, I, I, are you talking about the solid waste yeah. loan? Yes. And I, I can answer that. Go ahead, Doug. It, it's essentially an investment, if you will, of the wastewater fund to loan money to another fund. And it's very common. Uh, the law, you know, states that you, you have to pay it back with, you know, some interest and um, it's not a gift, but uh, it's, a lot of times a lot more efficient and, and cost effective for one utility to make it a, a loan to another utility rather than going out on the market and getting, you know, a commercial loan or, or a bond. So uh, we see it a lot, um, but it's more of an investment. It does get paid back uh, usually with interest and um, usually it's done only with funds that are within you know, a, a small chunk that, that the utility feels safe uh, lending that out rather than having it liquid. Thank you. 
Andrew, do you have another question? No, I just hear the floor of my hand. Okay, thank you. So no more clarifying questions, it looks like. So I'd like to know if that what, I understand we have public comment. Uh, yes, we do. If I can get right back to the, there we go. I'm at the final slide. And yes, we have one public commenter uh, who okay. does, have his, does have his hand raised. Uh, <laughs> Matt, if you'd like to talk, I believe you're, you're able to unmute. Hello, everyone. This is Matt Williams. Having sat in your seats, uh, I appreciate the excellent job that Doug Dove always does. And once again, Thank you. he's exceeded himself. And I'll use a little bit of my three minutes to pat him on the back and uh, and thank him for all the work he's done for the the city, both now and in the past. And well, I, I haven't we... started your clock, so you're good, Matt. That was all that was all pro pro bono there. That's OK, good. thank you. you well, there are a number of comments that I have. One of them is, is that I'm I'm absolutely going to 150 percent agree with you, Doug, that the winter water rates have 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 become less and less uh, viable with climate change. The reality is in our Mediterranean climate, they weren't viable in the first place. Chicago, where you aren't doing any irrigation in the winter because everything's frozen, yes, they do work. But the reality is, is that they, they, they don't work. And, and I was struck by the questions that were given, starting with Lorenzo's about What's the yeah? Where's the where's the dividing line between a dormitory style multifamily and a, a non-dormitory style? And when the whole issue of winter water rates came up, there was a question of what's a better proxy than winter water rates. Well, the reality is is that every one of us, we can look around this room and and across the table at each other and say, each of us create waste. We are human beings and waste is created in large part proportionally human being by human being. Now, it's not perfect and there are people who have water saving devices and, and the like, but I really seriously think that we should be doing uh, all of the rates in all of the categories except commercial on the basis of the proxy for the human beings in the house. That proxy is beds. So the question that Lorenzo asked of, uh, what about a, a mini maxi dorm, uh, mini dorm, where you've got 10 students in, in that house compared to a single family residence like the one that I'm in, you, you count the number of beds and you charge a rate by bed. Volumetric is not for any kind of conservation or reducing the usage, it's really truly to, to determine volume. So I think that that's extreme. That's the way I would certainly be going if I were in the room with you uh, uh, at this time. The other thing that I think is really important was before I left the Utilities Commission, we had discussions about rate balancing and looking at, because the individual user rate payer doesn't care about the individual rates of the individual utilities. They care about the total utility bill. So I think that we ought to be putting these things into the context of the total utility bill. And that that is where your, your affordability is going to come. And uh, I, I like everything that's been said, but I really think life gets much simpler and it's not that difficult, Stan that houses are designed with bedrooms. And if you count two beds per bedroom with some ability for people to file exceptions for uh, this bedroom is a one bedroom room, um, you, you, can, you can do it pretty quickly and easily and you have a very low maintenance situation. You only end up with changes when a house is modified or a new house is built or a new apartment is built. So those are my two cents and thank you for the extra seconds. Thank you, Matt. Are there any other members of the public here, Stan? No other members, that was it. Thank you. Can you go back to the slide of the recommendations? So for our purposes here, do you, is it better to take this one by one or one motion to cover all four? What is there any preference from staff on this? 
Uh, no, that's that's uh, your pleasure, Linda. I mean, I, I suspect, I mean, there might be some differences amongst the commission uh, with each question, but that's that's really for your uh, determination. Okay. Yeah. Then I'd like to bring forward a motion on the first one of accepting BWA and staff recommendation of a 60% fixed, 40% volumer volumetric rate. Um, is, do I have a second for that? I'll second. Thank you, Elaine. Do we want to um, have some more discussion on that? Seeing none, do we have any people who oppose? I'm, I'm sorry, Linda, I was, I was muted. I, I would like to uh, just have one, one comment before we go. Please. I, you know, while the difference between the moving to 60% right away and doing it over time while the effect on the overall bill is small, it looks like to be a dollar a month. It's an opportunity for us not to affect the, the overall revenue for, for the utility and, 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 and save the customer a dollar uh, for, for a year. And I, and I think that's probably something that you know, we should do. Thank you, Steve. Are you asking for us to a friendly? I, I, well, my or... preference, um, would be to go with the um, the plan that has the uh, the fixed rate uh, move over time. The phase in version yes. of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Elaine. Um, no, I I don't like the phase in. Uh, I think uh, I agree with Stan. I like the fact that the sixty forty is straightforward. It's not confusing. It isn't changing. Uh, I might disagree with that if it if the dollar amount were more, but if you're just talking a dollar amount, it, it, to me, phasing in isn't worth it. Okay. Well, I'm more comfortable keeping it at the fixed, you know, not phasing it in over time for that same reason to give people the ability to budget and give them certainty with their bills going forward. I think those are very valid points. Though, so Steve, you have an excellent point to regard and say. No, no, no worries. On that. Um, any, any other comments on this? So we're going to keep the motion as is at this point. I see nothing. Well, so let's call the question. Adrian, we do a roll call, please. Yes. Uh, Jerry Braun? Hi. Sorry, was that an I? Hi, that is Thank you. <laughs> uh, Andrew Cullen. Aye. Linda Deos. Aye. Steve Gallen. Aye. Uh, Lorenzo Kristoff. Yes. Uh, Elaine Roberts Messer. Aye. And Jan Troost. Aye. All right, motion passes. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to the next one. I see here the staff recommendation. Yes, we recommend simplifying the current rate structure. Oh God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Doctor calls coming in. I apologize. Um, and and for just for clarification, that is the the basically having one multifamily rate versus the four or five as it is currently. I can bring that slide up if you'd like to see it. Yeah, could you do that? Sure. Uh, Let's go back. It looked like it was four. Yeah, we're going, uh, let's see here. I'm getting there. <laughs> You're all there. there. So it'd be, we are recommending the highlighted multi-family one rate for all of them instead of having separate mm -hmm. for each one. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, some go up a little bit, some go down a little bit, but in the, in the end, from multifamily, you're generating the same revenue uh, with this rate across the whole spectrum, and it makes it a lot simpler for um, uh, finance and and uh, when we get applications coming in. And so this is separating out the dorm. The yes, this does not include the dorm. This is okay. Multi multifamily, right. less than five beds, right, Doug? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I will bring forward the motion to. I accept the staff's recommendation, VWA recommendation to simplify the current rate structure to that blended. You just took it away from me again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was going back to the last slide. I guess I should put this. <laughs> there you go. 
<laughs> Thank you to the blended rate for multifamily, excluding the five plus units. Is that clear, Adrian? That is clear for me. Hey, do I have a second on that? I'll second. Thank you, Elaine. Um, discussion on this motion. Not seeing any hands. Will you please do a roll call, Adrian? Absolutely. Jerry Braun? Aye. Andrew Cullen? Aye. Linda Deos? Aye. Steve Gellin? Aye. Lorenzo Kristoff? Aye. Elaine Roberts Musser? Aye. Jan Troost? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Should the city adopt a separate fixed rate per bed for future dormitory style multifamily customers? No, no. yes. <laughs> we, <laughs> so where, how would that, I mean, I'm trying to see a good way to word this. Well, I think, I think, I think that's it is, is, you know, does the commission agree with staff's recommendation to yeah. Institute a dormitory style, style multifamily <laughs> rate for with the with the uh, methodology that it's five plus beds per unit, uh, five or more beds per unit would be a subject to this rate. I'll I'll oh. move this one. Okay, thank you, Elaine. So I will second that. Any discussion on this point? Yeah, I would like to um, please just comment. I think. Um, Stan made a good point. When we're talking about rate structures, we should be talking about proportionality. It has nothing to do with affordability. It has to do with proportionality. Everybody needs to pay their fair share of the sewer rate. And I think we have to keep that foremost in our thinking. As far as affordability, certainly if we would like to say, city council, you need to look at possibly subsidizing uh, low income students, for instance, who might have a problem. I don't have a problem with that. And I think that might even be worth exploring. But I think as far as rate setting, we need it to be proportional. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, I don't see any other comments. No hands are up. So Adrian, let's do a roll call. All right, finding my mute button, uh, Jerry Braun. <laughs> Aye. Andrew Cullen? Aye. Linda Deos? Aye. Steve Gellin? Aye. Lorenzo Kristoff? Yes. Elaine Roberts Musser? Aye. Jan Troost? Aye. Motion passes. Great. Hey, let's go on to the next one. Should the city condense the current commercial rate categories? I would say yes. And can you bring up that slide? You had broken that down. Yes, I'm, I'm getting there. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Come on, Stan. Sorry. Keep up. I believe that's it right there. There we go. <laughs> so bring forward a motion to have four categories for commercial users. That would be low strength, domestic strength, medium strength, and high strength. Are you moving, Linda? Yes. I'll okay, I'll second. Sorry. Wait, Jan, I'll let you second that one. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I have I have one question. Sure. Um, are you aware, um, Stan or Doug, uh, of any commercial entity in Davis that would object to this? No. We haven't really asked uh, the specific question. No, but, but from your knowledge of the business are you know are you aware of sort of what sort of customers might feel that they they are harmed by this so i could i would i would uh, so so the answer the, the short answer is no uh, lorenzo but i would suggest that the last time we we adjusted um user class costs uh which was i believe in 15 or 17 apologize i might be mixing up uh, 2017, kind of studies. Yeah. 17 yeah um we we in fact uh, restaurants were pretty heavily impacted by that adjustment of strength, um, but uh, we got very little, very little comment in that regard. So I would suspect in, in this regard, we might hear some comments, but 
um, based on my prior history, I don't know that we would get a lot of pushback. And the, the caveat is, in this regard, we probably will, as we do now, have, have the potential to adjust someone if they object and believe they're in a different category. We would, we would be able to assess that and, and adjust that if needed per ordinance. Um, so we do have that uh, ability now, and we will have that in the future as well. You, you could do it based on measurements. Correct. If, yeah. if someone came in and said, look, I, I don't have, you know, as an example, the bakery was on there. Uh, we did have one bakery that said, look, we don't, we don't actually bake anything or put it down the drain. So we shouldn't really be in that highest strength category. Uh, our pre-treatment coordinator assessed that, and we were able to shift them into a, an appropriate category. So we do have that ability. Okay, thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, any other, oh, Jan? So I have a quick question. Um, Please. I, you know, I support this, but I would feel much more comfortable if somehow we had some data that did comparable commercial rates in other jurisdictions. I know we brought that up, uh, Doug, it may be too late, that train may have left the station, but I think it would be helpful to know that if for no other reason to secure and provide council with some comparative data uh, that what we proposed here um, is not out of line with what other uh, jurisdictions may or may not be doing. If it's possible to even compare them, I may not be able to compare them, I don't know. We, we can do the, uh, a survey of the commercial rates, and I apologize for not having that tonight. We'll, we'll, you, we'll submit that separately and to Adrian. She can do you expect it. anything really different than what we've got here, Doug? I mean, this isn't trying to prove one thing or another, just curious about how that stacks up. And I think it will help all customers say, okay, everybody's getting a fair shake here, you know? No, I, th I think your rates for commercial will be similar in, on the lower end of the scale as the residential rates. Um, and, and we've implemented these, um, you know, low standard, medium, high structures in a lot of cities and it's been well received. Uh, yeah, I, we I we like haven't the, had any pushback. I like, I like the model, I do. Uh, you know, I, I, and I, you know, I commend you for having done this. And thank you very much for being willing to just see some comparative rates, um, which I'll look for when we get the next, when you get that done, okay? Thanks very much. Thank you, Jan. Okay, let's call the question. Adrian, we have your roll call. All right, uh, so Jerry Braun. Hi. Uh, Andrew Cullen. Hi. Linda Deos. Yes. Steve Gellin. Yes. Lorenzo Kristoff. Aye. Elaine Roberts Messer. Aye. Neon Troost. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Um, thank you. All thanks. right. Thanks, everyone. Abigail. Happy holidays. Same to you. And thank you, everybody. Until next time. <laughs> Happy holidays, Doug and Abigail. Thanks for your work. Excellent. Right. Thank you. Thank you, right. everyone. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. <laughs> hey, John. Hey. Okay, we're now going to go on to this um, item 6B, Solemn Waste Cost of Study, sir, Cost of Service Study Request for Proposals. So, Aiden, are you the lead here? I am. So, I will go ahead and uh, I don't have a formal presentation. This is a, a pretty short um topic of discussion, at least from my end, um, in that we are starting another cost of service study process. Um, this is what we do with this commission. Um, so we're looking to start our solid waste cost of service study. Uh, and that starts with the request for proposals that we have drafted and was included in the packet for your review. Uh, tonight, we would look for two things. One, feedback and comments on that request for proposals. And then a motion for um, a commissioner, thank you, Sam, uh, to participate in the selection process for the consultant that the city would ultimately work with on this cost of service study. Um, this is the beginning for those uh, commissioners who have not been with us for a while. Generally speaking, our cost of service studies take about a year, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. So we are sort of at the, the start of this process. We would look to have recommendations um, to city council for January 2024, um, because we still do have one adjustment left in our current 218 schedule for solid waste 
for January 2023. Um, and we will get a little bit confused uh, towards the end of next year as we bring the forward the solid waste fund update with that recommendation for our next rate adjustment, along with um, what work we're doing on our solid waste cost of service study uh, at the same time, but we'll do our best to keep those separate. Um, but I'm here for any feedback and comments that you might have and uh, ready for the recommended commissioner to participate in our process. Okay, so I'm gonna look for hands up and I know Steve, you can't raise your hands while so calling you afterwards, but right now, is there anybody who has any feedback on this? Question, uh, and yes. again, I'm, I'm down in Burbank for uh, some uh, family related issues. So I have to I have to say I'm not as prepared, but do we have time to review the RFP itself? Yes, the RFP was in the packet. I, I was unable, I'm not because of any fault of yours, make it the fault on my part of not having enough time to really review the packet for a variety of health related issues. Absolutely. Um, so, so I is it too late to get feedback to you by uh, by writing or how how is this going to is tonight the last time we can give you feedback on the RFP itself? So, um, like I said, this the timing is is broad in the sense that we we take um, a great deal of time with our cost of service studies because obviously this process is extremely important for a wide variety of reasons. Um, we're at the start of what will be a long process what delays might be in that space now just mean we have a little bit more time at the end. Um, we do, like I said, have an existing uh, adjustment on January 2023, January 1st, 2023, already in place. So we have a bit of a buffer with this study. Um, and, you know, as we go into 2022 and start to implement the um, costs of SB 1383 compliance and do this cost of service study, we'll have just that much more data to be able to look at and evaluate as we go through the process. So um, we certainly could defer the discussion of the RFP itself to our January meeting. Um, if that would be uh, you know, appreciated by the group, we could have you know, any comments or questions that you might have submit to me. I can bring them back in January with our responses and a modified um, RFP. Um, that would be really the main thing. It usually takes about a month to have the RFP go through. Um, so we would look to that RFP being released in early January if we had approval tonight. If not, then uh, we would look to have that RFP in February. So the reason I'm asking this question is I know about two years ago, maybe even longer than that, I had asked if we would consider requiring any competitor dealing with our utilities to have a person on staff who is very knowledgeable about climate change and the impacts of climate change on every one of our utilities while we have that option open to us. Stan, if I'm not mistaken, you said, don't worry, we can do this in another type of RFP, uh, we get more information. And perhaps you may have considered that it's been done already and I don't know. But I would certainly personally like to see language in there that make that a requirement for bidders. Uh, and I don't know how other members of the commission feel about this, but it should be very clear. It's clear to me right now, for instance, that uh, in the New York Times two days ago, they had a county by county assessment of what now are the biggest threats to counties. And for Yolo County, the number one threat has moved from smoke and fire to water. And if anybody hasn't seen that, it's a report worth looking at. So I just throw that out for consideration and why I think we should very, be very diligent in what we are asking in the RFP from our consultants. And it may be everything is fine. Uh, I don't know, but I just, I personally haven't had the time. If other people feel everything's cool, you should go ahead and we should go ahead and just I'll abstain. But I just wanted to throw that out for people's consideration. Thank you, um, Jerry. Um, thank you, Jan, for that uh, reminder. I think that's really important. Um, my question sort of related to it, which is um, what kind of response do you expect um, 
uh, you know, sometimes you get one or two bids, and sometimes you get more. Uh, what 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 are what are we looking? What what are what are we expecting? And that kind of relates to, um, you know, the uh, you know the review process. So uh, there are a couple of things that I'd like to uh, respond to. First, um, the um, with solid waste, uh, it's not. Um, I'm trying to think of the phrase to use. It's not as fun as water or wastewater or some of our other more flashy utilities. Um, so we don't tend to have as many folks in the area that are focused on that type of work. Um, it's also in, in a lot of ways a little bit different of a utility because so many jurisdictions operate it in different ways. So there are some jurisdictions that have the entirety of their operation as the hauler. Um, there are some jurisdictions that have a portion of the hauler and a portion of the city, which is what Davis does. And there are some jurisdictions that provide the entire service themselves. Um, so because of that, the landscape of solid waste and solid waste, solid waste rate setting, try to say that three times fast, um, is, is a little more complicated in these types of studies. Generally speaking, we see between two to three uh, proposals for these studies. The last time we had one proposal, um, I think a couple times before we might have had maybe two um, for our uh, SB 1383 um, our RFP for the implementation plan, we saw two proposers. Um, so it's usually between two and three. We would look for about an hour of folks time for two meetings. So two hour long meetings with about a week or, a, or two weeks to review the proposals in between. We'd have sort of a kickoff and then the proposal review. And then we would have that discussion with staff. Um, that's really the, the commitment that we're looking for from um, our commissioner that chooses to participate in this process. Um, I will say that I know we've had this discussion before um, and we have not necessarily been on the same wavelength, um, but the evaluation of a cost of service is of a very particular type of activity for a consultant team to perform. And for the most part, those folks are going to be, they're going to be accountants, they're going to be, um, you know, folks that are really looking at the numbers, the budgets, the financing, and then those, those real complicated rate structures and looking at how we calculate these rates, how we have that cost proportionality among customers. A real key piece of what we're looking for with this next study is gonna be looking at that cost allocation for our customers, um, because we did see with the uh, COVID impacts, some pretty significant hits to revenue only for the solid waste utility um, when those commercial customers went offline. So we want to look at that and say, hey, what can we learn from what we experienced during this event? Um, and how can we build maybe a little bit more resiliency into our rates? Um, in that perspective, that's what we look for that cost of service consultant to do. Um, the, the climate change, the environmental impacts, all those types of um, those uh, studies that need to be performed are different groups of people. Um, we had a great opportunity in our implementation plan to work with teams from different firms to perform pieces of our implementation plan. Some of it focused on the operation of the utility, some of it focused on the finance, but those were separate teams and sub consultants of the main consultant. There was not one team that would be able to perform the breadth of that. Um, and I would also add that our solid waste utility, like I said in Davis is unique. We don't have infrastructure in the same way that other cities do. We certainly have investment in that infrastructure um, that, that we've talked about multiple times, um, but we, it's, it's not necessarily the same uh, in terms of what we'd be looking for, what the city would be accountable for in terms of the infrastructure, like our other utilities um, as well. So things to consider for our slightly strange little utility um, of solid waste. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to say something, you know, one of the first in-depth forays I had in this 
in our utilities commission was being that person with regard to our stormwater um, cost of cost study cost of service study below. And it was fascinating. And I found it was a great way to really delve into one of the utilities that's under our purview. And I would highly recommend it to one of our newer folks or somebody who has done this over and over and over again to consider being that person who participates in the RFP process. I really did get much from it. And I believe it will only add to the depth of your knowledge and ability to participate or give more feedback and such to the um, commission as a whole and to our community. So Elaine, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I think um, we've had the discussion before about having climate change experts and I don't think it's necessary, especially for solid waste for all the reasons that uh, Adrian has talked about. Um, I think when you're talking about rate setting, uh, you are talking about a different uh, set of experts. And I don't want to bog down this process any more than we have to. So I would like to just go ahead and accept the proposal as it is, unless other people have, um, you know, corrections or something tonight. But I'd like to move the process forward. Elaine, I might I might add just a little bit to that to say that, you know, absolutely. And, I, and I'm not saying that climate change is not an important consideration, because of course it is. Um, it is a little bit more of an impact directly to us with some of our other utilities. But with SB 1383 and the changes that we are required to make by the state, you know, with that regulation, that is actually addressing climate change, um, you know, for the state. Um, that actual process of implementing that is uh, looking to address climate change, um, which I think is an important consideration in, um, you know, incorporating those regulations and our new processes into the cost of providing the service for our residents. Yeah, good point, Adrian. Um, Andrew. Yeah, I just want to ask Adrian, you know, I'm in the same bucket as uh, Jan that I, uh, I missed in the past. Well, my case is I missed this in the packet. I would like to still provide feedback, but I don't think that I'm as worried about, I don't want to sell it by a month. It's consequential. Is it possible to just email in uh, written feedback? Um, so yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, for things that are um, minor changes or if, uh, as Elaine often does, finds grammatical errors that I have made or other, um, you know, smaller issues that aren't content related. Um, I'm absolutely happy to receive those at any time I can make those changes. When we're talking about actual content changes and adding stipulations within the RFP or other types of requirements, I really would like that to be, you know, a, a discussion and a consensus with this group, um, rather than make those sort of um, blanket determinations, um, because, you know, this group is such a key piece of that process. So I think that, you know, there's, and I guess I'll, I'll back up just a bit, if I may, really quickly and say that we have a couple stages in this process. So we're gonna be looking at the draft RFP and having that be released. We will also be looking at the scope of work for the recommended consultants. So if we come back and there's a, a piece, excuse me, that is connected to something that we've got in that RFP, but we didn't maybe spell out as particularly, or maybe there's a little bit of an expansion, we can certainly talk about that with the consultant before we have that contract negotiated or we execute that contract. Um, but this is that opportunity for setting kind of the baseline. Um, I, so that would be. I, I, yeah, I just, I do the hear some of the concerns about having uh, the right subject matter experts to what you said about how many of these firms are typically accountants. Um, I just wanna make sure that future RFPs and consultants are, are thinking about climate and environmental issues that are, uh, you know, trying to, you know, get upstream and not just reacting to, you know, you know it's good that we're reacting to SB uh, 1383, but, uh, you know, I think there, there are going to be new challenges on the horizon. So having people in house that are able to foresee these, you know, help fill that into our rates or, you know, we, yeah, factor that in. I mean, climate change is going to cost money so I, to address. 
Absolutely. And I, I think what I would what I would offer is that as part of that a cost of service study process, we're building in the reserve, we're building in rate stabilization, we're building in pieces of the the structure of the finances of the utility that will buffer for those types of changes as they come. Um, right, you know, previous to the last time we did an adjustment with this uh, with this utility, we did not have. A, a reserve, we did not have a buffer, um, and we experienced challenges because of that or in, you know, around that. Um, so I think that as the cost of service study, how it accounts for climate change or future impacts is through the rate stabilization and the, um, you know, the uh, reserve. The other pieces of how climate change actually impacts the utility, what it might cost, um, to that particular utility are things that that we have said would be performed by a different consultant and that information would be put into the study um, to be able to fill some of those gaps with the understanding that we have that reserve and we have that rate stabilization built into to try and buffer our customers. Great, thanks. Thank you. Lorenzo. Yeah, I have uh... Two questions. One is about SB 1383. Can you just say a little bit about <laughs> how this RFP differs because of 1383 compared to the RFP you <laughs> might have released five years ago? What, what, how is that reflected in, in the RFP? So this RFP is looking at um, the cost of service of providing the utility. Um, which would include compliance with SB 1383. It's also specifically looking at a customer cost allocation um, so that we would be able to see why we might've experienced what we experienced during COVID with our commercial customers. Um, we are not looking at in this RFP, the removal of on-street yard material pile collection service. Um, we are you know, focused on some sort of key things that we've seen over the last uh, five years um, that we, you know, need to address. Um, that's really sort of the major difference in terms of the specific topics of what that consultant is looking for. We have an RFP that's structured to say, hey, here are our minimums. If you see opportunities, if you have ideas, if you would like to suggest anything, um, please share that with us and add it as an additional cost and indicate what that's going to mean. Um, and we do have a lot of proposers that take advantage of that piece of our RFP and have some great ideas about what we might look for based on sort of how we present that baseline. Okay, and then you, you sort of anticipated my next question, the, the on-street piles collection. Uh, are, did you say that you're not including that in this cost of service study? So we're including the cost of that service because absolutely it is a piece of what we present. We're okay. including what it is if we have a customer that does not have that service. Obviously there are some folks based on their property and where they're located, they, they don't actually have access to the service. The cannery is a great example. Nobody in the cannery has on-street yard material pile collection. Um, okay. So we need to know what the cost of that service is so that we can uh, provide that credit for those customers that don't receive it. Um, but uh, we're not looking at elimination of that program okay. in this RFP. Okay. And then just to follow up what I heard you say in response to Andrew, I think is, you know, the, the COVID impact and the, the shutting down of businesses and uh, loss of revenue, to me, that is a climate change impact. Mm -hmm. So um, even though... Um, we may not be able to identify those in advance. It sounds like your general strategy for that is going to be through the reserve fund, that you can absorb revenue losses that occur because of how it changes the business environment or other impacts it may have on the revenue stream. Certainly. And I think one thing that we've definitely seen is, you know, obviously cities move slowly. Um, and Proposition 218 processes move slowly. And so if we have something that we can identify and say, this is a problem, this is a challenge, mm -hmm. we have an ability to buffer that for our customers while we're looking to set up what we need to set up to be able to adjust those rates if necessary, that would be what we would be looking for. So I know we've had this discussion with this commission where if, if we do find a reason 
why we need to break into that rate schedule and say, you know what, we're in a 218, but actually we've got something going on. We really need to address this. We can, um, yeah. we just need to have that time to be able to do it. And I, I think in a lot of ways with the solid waste utility in particular, because of how it operates in this community, um, that's often what we see. Is this change something that's going to be a long-term change or will it be a short-term change? What will that look like? You know, if we can model losing 10% of our customers again, what does that look like? Um, those are the types of things that we would look to do through this rate, stead, rate study. And it seems that there's some, well, I guess I, I refresh me on the, the contract with Recology. To what extent is the risk of something like that an impact on Recology versus a risk on the city or one or the other or shared? Or can you say a little about that? So the risk is, is shared in the sense that if the need for waste services goes down, everybody's revenue goes down. Um, in, in the case of what happened over the short term that we saw the loss within the, the solid waste utility, um, you know, we have an agreement with Recology. We pay them a certain amount. It certainly dropped when we had less service that was necessary, but not proportionally by you know, the cost of that service. So in a lot of ways, the city has the, the faster impact, um, but it's certainly felt by both. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify, Andrew, do you have another question? No. Okay. End. okay. Um, so Jerry. Uh, you know, just going back to the, these are great questions and I, uh, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, the, I, I think that what I would hope for in the consultant would be um, someone, someone who was a kind of conscious of the pace of change in that, you know, uh, all kinds of things are changing. Uh, there are some are climate driven and, and others aren't, but the changes are happening more, more quickly. And I, I think that you know, a rate consultant, I would hope, would be able to help the city um, kind of anticipate, you know, what could what could possibly change in the next five years that that might affect rates, or what kind of contingencies need to be considered. Um, you know, I I would put that in the category of of you know criteria for selecting a consultant. If nothing else, it you know it, it would send the right message that that we really. Uh, we really expect uh, something more than just, uh, you know, adding up numbers and, and uh, seeing what they tell us. But, you know, what, what's, how are, what are the things that are going to change the numbers in, in even the, you know, the, the short term of, of five years? Sure. Uh, you know, I think one thing that, that I would add to this discussion is that um, what we saw with SB 1383, uh, the, the breadth and the depth of those regulations in a lot of ways took people by surprise, um, even professionals. So uh, in terms of, and I would argue also maybe even some members of Cal Recycle. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the goal of having the reserve, the goal of having the rate stabilization, having the structures in place within the rates to have that fiscally healthy um, revenue stream is what we look for from that rate consultant to provide that, that buffer. And then for those regulations, you know, anticipating that they're gonna come, anticipating that there's gonna be some storm that we're gonna have to pay $200,000 to get material off the streets, right? Those types of, of scenarios are built into the need for the reserve and for the rate stabilization. Exactly what those scenarios are, exactly how they would impact a lot of that goes with the state regulations and that whole rate setting or not rate setting the um, rulemaking process that takes a lot of time and it takes you know a number of years for anyone to really understand exactly how it's going to impact so really with the with the rate study what we're looking for is the buffer with the other reviews and other studies like with the implementation plan we're seeing more of that practical this is what's coming this is what you're going to need to do next this is you know the the regulations as we as we read them thank you um elaine yeah i just have a quick question 
are we ever revisiting the leaves in the street issue? So uh, yes, I think that part of our goal in not talking about it outside of the cost of providing that service right now is that we know with SB 1383, we're gonna need to do a lot. We know that this utility is still kind of in that recovery phase. Um, so we wanna look at, get that stabilization in place and then look at different opportunities. Um, and, and we know that the yard material pile collection is uh, a hot topic. <laughs> People are very invested and, and very passionate about it. I mean, we absolutely know that with this commission. So we, we look at, is there another opportunity or a different time that we might look at yard material pile collection on its own, knowing that it will likely take over the entire conversation. Um, and we let this process go the way that um, we need it to, to ensure that our, our rates and our uh, revenue is where it needs to be. Got it. Before I go back to you, Jan, I want to check in with Steve to see if you had any comments. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I, and I, I think this is not inconsistent with what you've been saying, Adrian, but what, what I'm hearing is a lot of the rate study is about the reserves so that we can address things we can't, can, and can or may not be able to anticipate fully. But I, is, isn't there another uh, avenue where we can use rate structure to incent behaviors um, to change how people act. It, it, it's, it's a lot of where this conversation's going is reacting to sort of what we know, but isn't, isn't affected in, a, in our current rate structure. And I think you look at the, some of the other utilities in Davis, and I think what you guys have done a really good job of is, is create appropriate incentives, uh, be, be creative, be proactive as opposed to reactive. And I, I'm not sure if that work to me seems integral to a rate study or at least works in parallel with it. And I wonder if there's just a work plan that addresses, these are all the things as a committee we need to address either specifically as part of the rate plan or in parallel with it. I would absolutely agree. And you know, um, the solid waste utility, the rates are set up to incentivize diversion. So um, the, the way that it currently is, your, your service comes with the size of your trash can. Um, depending on the size of your trash can is, is sort of the cost of service it's proportional to that size. So if you size down, then your cost decreases. You can have sort of unlimited, I should say residential customers can have unlimited recycling. Um, there is no cost associated with that currently. Um, there is one free organics cart with every customer. Uh, additional carts are available at a cost. Um, so it is, the rates are kind of structured in a similar fashion to incentivize diversion. Um, for our commercial customers, same thing. You can lower your costs if you're lowering the amount of trash service that your business is receiving. Um, the challenge that we've had is the organics component. We introduced that in 2016. We did not adjust rates at that time for a wide variety of reasons we don't need to get into right now. And then we did see an increase in the landfill tipping fees for organics and some other components that, that sort of made our expenditures increase over our revenues and we saw the, the challenge with our utility. So that is something that we definitely need to look at through this next study, but I would say that absolutely how we set up our rates um, and the subsequent impacts or not on behavior is a key piece of the discussion. Anything else, Steve? No, thank you. You got it. Okay, Jan. Quick question. I'm wondering um, how many other people besides myself really didn't get a chance. Was the intent of tonight's meeting to actually review the draft RFP? or just to sort of like assume that people did review it and just go yay or nay on it. And the second question is just more directly to the other, the other people, <clears throat> has everybody had a chance to review it? Am I the only one who really hasn't had the opportunity to, to do that? Um, you know, um, just a question. I, I reviewed it. <laughs> I reviewed it. So like I said, uh, we could certainly defer the discussion of the RFP to next month. Um, the challenge is the timing and getting started. Uh, we know that this is gonna be a long process. We also know that we have 
a good amount of time. Um, one of the things about the solid waste utility that's a little bit different from our other utilities for those folks who've been through this process before is we have one uh, account for the, this utility as opposed to our other utilities where we often have three or four. So it, it's in a lot of ways a little bit easier from the financial piece of you know pulling that data, doing that first financial sort of evaluation. Um, but I mean, it's 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 up to this this commission. If you would like us to come back, we absolutely can. Uh, if we were not clear in the recommendations that we would like to see an approved RFP to go out, then that's absolutely on us. And next time, we can definitely work to make sure that that is is much more clear um, in our our suggestions for the topics for the evening. Okay, hey, thank you. Um Jan, your hand is still up, so I just want to circle back to see if you had more. You're good? Okay, and Emma, I haven't heard from you. I just wanted to know if you had any comments on, on this at this point. No, so this will be my first time going through a full process with you all. Um, so I'm excited to learn from you about how it works, but um, still feeling, yeah, like I'm in the learning phase. Um, and it's, it's it was it was great to read the RFP and kind of begin to understand what our standard process is as a commission. And just to put out there, when I did the stormwater one, that was my first to go through the RFP process. And yeah. the person doing it was a great way to, as I said, dive into it in that way. So do I sense enough consensus here to go forward with this RFP or would people still like, I mean, like the opportunity to um, give more comments on, on this. Elaine? Uh, I personally think we should just move forward with it. I don't think there's enough, you know, controversy about this that uh, it's worth, you know, stalling at this point. Lorenzo? Um, well, I... I was negligent and didn't review this in advance, but you know, given uh, the answers to questions, I guess um, I would feel okay about approving it and um, with the possibility that if I review it in the next week or so, I can send in some comments. Yeah, I think so. I, I, could, I could offer maybe a compromise um, and, and we wouldn't need a motion for the, the RFP to move forward, but we would like a motion for whoever would like to participate and we can have that discussion um, mm. you know, in the next month if we need to as well. Um, but we could say, okay, we're, we're tentatively on board. We're, we're thinking this would, might be good to move forward. Uh, I can certainly wait until a particular time um, and let you guys know what that would be. If I receive feedback and comments from commissioners that are, you know, heavily content related, there's some significant concerns in terms of what we've got in there, then at our next discussion for the agenda prep uh, for Linda and Jerry, or, you know, whoever is chair and vice chair, actually in January, it'll still be you two, um, uh, we can say, hey, you know, this, this came up, this is a, a serious consideration, and, and we need to have this discussion. Would that work? Yeah, I, I like that. I, Sounds good to me. Thank you, Adrian. That's a good. Uh, I like that. Okay. And thanks, Lorenzo, for your Cause, suggestion. Because life takes over. <laughs> I understand that very, very much. Um, and I really want to acknowledge the comments that were made around the climate change issues. When we have to be looking outside of our silos and really be having outside the box, you know, where where can we address this issue, this huge issue that's affecting our community, our planet? And knowing that you all are so focused on this makes it so much better for me <laughs> in the sense of not alone and having my, my concerns in this regard, but I, I recognize that this is having to do with, <laughs> you know, what is the cost of state and what can we charge folks for the service that they are being provided, but we can't, I mean, climate change has to be always in the equation in some regard. So thank you in that. So is there anybody who is interested in participating in the review of the submitted proposals? It's probably not gonna happen until the end of January at the earliest, um, end of February. Again, we're looking at maybe 
two, two to three hours of extra time to do this. Um, again, it was a great way for me to learn more about the mission and a great way for me to learn specifically about how the reproposal function mean works. <laughs> and if there is somebody who is would just love to do this, say something now. <laughs> and I'm not going to go out there and say, okay, I'm going to assign you, <laughs> but well, it's in, and for others, so I'd be interested. I have a background in uh, hazardous waste before my current role, which crossed some okay. of the solid waste as well. But I want I want to steal the opportunity either. <laughs> Andrew, thank you. A anybody else? I would also be open to doing it, but I'm happy to wait for a future uh, <laughs> RFP process. Thank you. We'll um, say our next process is likely going to be water, but it would be in a few, a year or two. So if anyone okay. is interested in water, that will be coming up in a little bit. And thank you, Emma, and thank you, Andrew, in that looking at what's on the next on the agenda and knowing that somebody who's interested in vice chair, <laughs> um, Andrew, if would you be comfortable stepping back on this one? Yeah. And Emma, go forward on this. Yep. You would be? Okay. Yep. Awesome. I, That's very kind of you, Andrew. Thank you. No, that's why I wasn't going <laughs> volunteer. So. Yeah. so I would like to put forward a motion to have Emma or O'Rourke, and I can't see your name. I can't, I know I'm going to it. <laughs> have Emma be our member of our commission to participate in the review of the submitted proposal. Do I have a second for that? A second that. Thank you, Jan. Any further discussion? And Emma, thank you. You are going to learn so much from this process. Um, I'm excited. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Adrian, would you do a roll call? Absolutely. Uh, Jerry Braun. Aye. Andrew Cullen. Aye. Linda Deos. Yep. Steve Gallen. Aye. Lorenzo Christoph. Yes. Elaine Roberts Mosser? Aye. Jan Trust? Aye. Motion passes. Congratulations, Emma. And trust me, working with Adrian and Stan, they will hold your hand through the process <laughs> and as they did mine. Is there any public comments on no, this? Uh, no public comment, no members of the public. Thank you, Stan, for putting that up there to remind me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go on to 6C, consideration of candidates for a chair, vice chair. Um, I will start by putting it out there. I am interested in continuing on as chair. Um, so I just want that to be put out there to everybody. Um, are there, is there anybody else interested in being chair? Okay. And vice chair. I understand there's somebody who could be interested in this. And so if he would mind speaking, that would be great right now. Yeah, thanks Linda. Uh, this is Andrew. I would like to be considered for vice chair. Um, the last year thank great learning opportunity. I've been given an opportunity, so Emma, I'm happy to share them around. I've been, this group has been really great to work great. with and supportive. So yeah. And thank you, Andrew. I mean, I would really appreciate the work you've been doing as our liaison to NRC. And so I think you're ready to do this if you wish. Um, so would you like us to do vice chair? Or we don't have to do anything that we aren't voting, right? We don't vote it. So we're not voting on this until January. Yeah, tonight, right. yeah, si simply we, we wanted to tee this up so uh, uh, commissioners could express their interest in either the chair or the vice chair so that in January, if members are not present, you know, their wishes are known. Uh, as okay. an example, Linda, yes. <laughs> I, I may not be, yeah, I may not be present. Correct. And, that was what this is for. Okay, thank you. And also, we have our existing subcommittees and liaison appointments. So, Jerry, you've expressed an interest of in being the liaison to national resources. And if Andrew's taking on this new role next month, now might be a time to see if that interest is still there. Yeah, I've given some thought to this and what I might be willing to do or what I am willing to do 
uh, be to um, come back to the commission with um, kind of a mission statement for the, you know, for the liaison. In other words, what what do we expect uh, the liaison to do, and and uh, do we agree with that? Um, that and you know, at that point, um, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, I think it'd be good to discuss it, and I might or might not be interested, uh, but um, uh, but I think it's a good step to kind of define what the you know what what we'd hope the liaison to uh, to uh, do for us. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, we could talk about it now, but I think we can talk about it. Let, yeah, let's wait on that. Um, anything else you need to hear from us, Adrian, on this topic? Um, so we do have, let me pull up here, two existing subcommittees. I don't know if there was any desire in looking at those as well, um, just because it is on the agenda. So we have the um, Community Resilience Subcommittee that is still doing work. We've got the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan Process Subcommittee that is still doing work. Um, so in thinking about roles and how things might shift and where things might go. Um, if there's something about one of those subcommittees where someone thinks, hey, maybe that's something I wanna look at and might be interested in, that's something that we can talk about in January, we could talk about now. Um, that's kind of what we're looking at in, in sort of this year shift um, and, and new opportunities, You know, not necessarily at the same time that these subcommittees were established as we normally do, but just kind of that opportunity of the fresh year to think, hey, what do we think, what might we want to do? Okay. I don't think we need to change anything at this point unless somebody right now is like, hey, I want on. <laughs> or, hey, I want on. Um, Lorenzo. Um, yeah, so Steve and Elaine and I haven't really had a chance to reconvene on the resilience subcommittee and what we want to do. So I would suggest if it's okay with Steve and Elaine, that um, we try, we have a, a conversation early January in advance of the next commission meeting and come back with suggestions as to what we would imagine we would do if we continued or whether or not we should continue uh, and, and have a, a commission decision at that time. Okay. So, uh, I think that's an excellent idea, Lorenzo. That's okay. good to you, Steve. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, Jan, yeah. want to say something? Maybe a similar conversation. Um, if Andrew, if things emerge as they might appear at this point, then and Jerry were to come through with his, would does that mean we could recon reconstitute uh, the CAP work group? I don't see why, see why not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to be clear yeah. about that. So, you yeah. know, I would assume that, that uh, given Jerry's role as a liaison, if that were to come to pass, that he would be, uh, Jerry, clarify if I'm wrong, but should you decide to do that, would that mean you would be willing to be part of that, of the CAP team? Yeah, sure. Short answer is is yes. I will. Okay, thank you. That, that, yeah. Looking for a short answer, so thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, do we have any public comment on this? No attendees. All right then. Let's move on to seven A Commission Staff Communication. The long range calendar. Stand here. Yeah, yeah. Long range oh. calendar in front of you there on the screen. Uh, mm hmm. So we can take the wastewater off. Um, so that's that's a yay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, I don't know. I don't know that I heard anything to add at this point. So we do have um, uh, maybe a little bit larger of an item when we're talking about the election um, in looking at the subcommittee structures and the liaisons. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Might okay. to bolster that item. Um, sure. Yeah. And then I know that there was a request from the Community Resilience Subcommittee to have an item in January, mm -hmm. but that might be kind of uh, part of that larger discussion. Um, or, you know, we can uh, chat with Linda and Jerry before the meeting to see where we might be with that one. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I, I think in the interest of moving moving that forward, I think if, if, if the subcommittee has a meeting that's been suggested in early January, I, th I think there's gonna be something material to talk about in January from that subcommittee. Okay. That's okay, great. so you can add that into the suggestions for our agenda prep meeting? Yes. Yep. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, no public comment. Or no public comment. Well, was our, our last meeting for 2021 yes. ready for adjournment? <laughs> So motion, I'll bring motion it. to adjourn. Yes. A motion yeah, to adjourn, yeah. Jan. I'll second that. Any opposition? Seeing none. Thank you, everybody. Happy, happy holidays. Stay warm, stay dry, stay safe. Yes. Happy, happy holiday, holiday, everyone. And Adrian, Stan, thanks for your work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Good meeting. Well done. Bye bye, y'all. <laughs>